Well, good afternoon and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with John Banville in conversation with Barbara Lane. My name is Jamie Madsen. I'm the marketing and events coordinator here and will also be your host for the afternoon. So just a couple of items to note before we get started. Go ahead and keep an eye on your chat box today. I will be using this to share uh, information about today's title, a discount code, future Copperfields events, and other goodies. So keep an eye there. And the format will feature between 30 to 40 minutes of speaking and will be followed by a live Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Please go ahead and submit your questions and comments there rather than replying to me in the chat box. So now I'm really excited to introduce today's author, John Banville. John was born in Wexford, Ireland in 1945 he is the author of 18 novels, including The Sea, which won the 2005 Man Booker Prize. In 2011, he was awarded the Franz Kafka Prize. In 2013, he was awarded the Irish Penn Award for Outstanding Achievement in Irish liter Literature. He currently lives in Dublin. In Conversation with John is the books columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle and the events director here at Copperfields, Barbara Lane. So they are with us to discuss John's newest title, April in Spain. And I know we all wanna dive right in. So I'm handing it straight to you, Barbara. Thank you, Jamie. And um, over the years, I have interviewed many, many writers. And I am beyond excited to interview John Banville. He is one of my favorites for reasons that will be quickly become apparent to you. And you have tuned in for that reason, both his fiction and nonfiction. And this new book has a special place in my heart because it's about, it takes place in one of my favorite places in the world, which is San Sebastián, Spain. So I'm gonna start right in uh, by asking John a question. I know he's been asked before, but I think our listeners and viewers will wanna know. Your new book, um, April in Spain, features Quirk. Uh, the beloved to us pathologist um, in 1950s Dublin. And of course, it formerly would have been written under the name Benjamin Black. That's a name that you um, abandoned with Snow, your last novel, and you killed him off saying that you didn't need that rascal anymore. Why didn't you need him? Well, it's, it's very simple. I am, um, in order to write in Spain, I had to go back and check some fictional facts in previous books. And uh, since I can't bear to read my own books, I really can't, I mean, it makes me physically ill. I hit on the idea of listening to them in audiobooks. And uh, <clears throat> a few of those books are written by, uh, written by, read by Timothy Dalton, who was a James Bond in his day. Everybody really laughs at him and says he was a terrible James Bond. I already thought that was a, a mark of quality in an actor, but they were. Uh, but he read them so beautifully. He performed them so beautifully and he kept his Welsh accent because he's a Welshman. Didn't try to put on an Irish accent. And uh, he obviously liked the books and he read them very intimately. And since I'm an, an, I'm an insomniac, I was listening to them at night two or three in the morning, this voice speaking to me in the dark. And it struck me at one point, oh, these are not bad books. These are not too bad at all. Why am I hiding behind a pseudonym? So I thought I'd kill off, they will kill off Benjamin. But the irony is that <laughs> in Spain, where this book is set, I have to keep Benjamin Black because he is far more popular and well-known than Banville is. So a Spanish friend of mine said, oh yes, you're sending Quirk down to retire in Spain. You're sending Benjamin Black down to retire in Spain, like retired English stockbrokers and <laughs> large criminals. So yes, I've sent, I've sent Benjamin down to retire to Spain. Well, Spain, as you alluded to, is one of the countries where your books sell the best, perhaps the country. Why do you think that is? <laughs> I'm not sure they sell the best. I have a large reputation there. Of course, reputation doesn't necessarily mean sales. Uh, well, first of all, I have a superb 
editor down there, Maria Fassi, and, and my publisher of Guara in Spain. She is um, she's a formidable woman. I will go to Spain and I will do three days of eight interviews a day back to back. Uh, how she gets them, I don't know where she gets them from. But then Spain has a wonderful cultural journalism still down there. It doesn't exist here. It doesn't exist much in America either, I'm afraid. Uh, but also there's a fact that Ireland and Spain are quite alike in many ways. We have a very dark history. Mm -hmm. We had terrible civil wars. Uh, we had the absolute power of the Catholic Church for a long time. Mm -hmm. We had a so-called benign dictator. They had Franco. We had de Valera. So we're quite alike in that. But I've just come back from Spain. I came back from Spain yesterday. And... Um, I have to tell you, Ireland is not much like Spain. The wine is different, the food is different, the sunshine is different. Uh, so I don't know, I don't know. How does one account for readers? I don't know. Where, where were you in Spain, just out of curiosity on this last I was in Madrid and then I went to Malaga and then I went to Cadiz, and I went back to Malaga and then I went back to Madrid. Uh, I don't know how I managed that down there for food and drink, but I did somehow. You know? <laughs> well, you have that glow to you. So I, it's, it seems um, I understand that you were in Spain because I can see it in your face. You have a glow. Okay. So Quirk, um, the character Quirk, who um, features in these novels that formerly were written by Benjamin Black, but now under your own name, lives in the apartment in Dublin, which you inherited from your aunt uh, when you first arrived in, no, maybe not, but what the, the apartment your aunt had when you first arrived in Dublin from Wexford, where you grew up, as Jamie said, um, why did you put him there? It's a wonderful place to live for a start. It was Upper Mount Street in Dublin. It's one of the most beautiful streets in the world, I think. Um, when I lived there in the early 60s, um, <laughs> it was glorious squalor, uh, big Georgian house, uh, but no heating. Uh, the plumbing was elementary, shall we say. Uh, I would wake up in, in the winter, I would wake up in the morning in my enormous bedroom and there would be frost on the inside of the windows. Um, but it was a wonderful place to live. Uh, W.B. Yeats's daughter, Anne Yates, had the apartment below mine. Um, all kinds of literary people used to be about in those days. I didn't take much part in it because I didn't, wasn't much interested in the Irish literary world of those days, which is mostly an Irish drinking world. Um, <clears throat> I think more great novels and more great poems were drunk away in pubs of Dublin than were written. Um, it was a tough time. Yeah. You know, there was extreme censorship. Um, I, you know, I, even still, I, I, I sometimes look at movies on the, on the, the internet. I, I recently watched uh, that movie, Don't Look Now. Um, and when I saw it, it was a much shorter version because they cut out all the sex scenes. Um, and of course, books were censored. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend John McGowan, great Irish novelist, he, he tells a funny story, told a funny story, no longer with us. <clears throat> he was a teacher in school and he was fired because of a book he thought. But then he went to see the principal. The principal said, John, <clears throat> we have to let you go. We could have put up with the book. The book was bad enough. But you had to go and marry a foreign woman and divorce foreign woman. He said, and the women of Ireland, the tongues hang out for a man. And John said, well, the tongues weren't hanging out in my direction. So. <laughs> I mean, he made a wonderful joke of it, but he had to go and work on building sites in England. So it was a very tough, tough world. Very a very poor world economically, but more importantly, spiritually poor world. 
but a world that was, you know, we made the best of it. You know, it's, it's all very well to look back. But when we're living in an era, we don't know how poor it is or how rich it is until long afterwards. And indeed, you do look back in one of your books that is my very favorite book, and I gift to anyone I know who's going to Ireland, which is Time Pieces, a Dublin memoir. And it's a very personal portrait of your Ireland. Um, and um, although all of the things you're describing were in effect, the censorship, the poverty, the rudimentary plumbing and so forth, Dublin was a place of magical promise for you, a country boy, wasn't it? Well, you see, I never thought of myself as a country boy. I was simply a Dubliner in waiting. Uh -huh. uh, I, I, this town that I, was, that I grew up in, that I was born in, grew up in, works that I never learned the names of the streets. So I thought I wouldn't be here long enough to make it worthwhile to learn the name of the streets. So I know the street with the post offices and the street with the cinemas. So I was just waiting to go. I was like Chekhov's sisters, you know, I, I wanted to go to Moscow. <laughs> I want to go to Dublin. Dublin to me was in those days as the promise was as rich as Paris or Moscow or San Francisco. And in 1967, I went to San Francisco. Uh, I mean, I'd been to Paris, I'd been to Rome, I'd been to Greece, I went to San Francisco. And this was Extraordinary revelation for me. And this is San Francisco, 1967. Mm -hmm. I can still remember going to a supermarket in Berkeley and looking at these lines of vegetables and fruits. I'd never seen such things before. I thought somebody had put marijuana in my, <clears throat> in my breakfast cereal. Maybe they had. <laughs> no, no, no. This was just color and life and freedom and beauty. Uh, it was wonderful to see. I never seen an avocado before. Oh, sorry, avocado pears were sweet things, you know. So then I discovered, and I had certainly never seen them. Oh, there were lots of things I'd never seen before. Well, so anyway, to, to go back to your question, why did I put Quirkin up in my street? Because it was a beautiful place to live. It was where I lived. It was where I wrote my first stories. But uh, Quirk's apartment is much more luxurious than when I lived in. Sorry, I didn't get that last part. He's what? Quirk's apartment is far more luxurious than the one that ah, I lived in. You've also said that Quirk, and I'm quoting, comes from the damaged recesses of my Irish soul. Do you want to expand upon that? Oh, did I say that? Oh. You did, you did. <laughs> Trouble these days is that everything you say is recorded and stored somewhere and can be revisited. Um, well, yes, I suppose he does. I don't much like Quirk. I don't dislike him, but I just find him rather boring. Mm -hmm. okay. he's, too, he's too troubled. He's too, he carries too much weight. This is why I've invented this new protagonist, uh, St. John Strafford. Yes. Uh, who is an impossibility, by the way, because he's Protestant. He's Anglo-Irish Protestant um, from the big house, and he's a detective in the Irish Guard of Force, and that could that never have been possible. So I'm working with this, this impossible being, and I like that. I, I, he's, he's a wonderful departure, very different than Quirk. He first appears, of course, in The Secret Guest, I believe. Not only Protestant, but heir to an upper crust English family. So, no, he's not, he's, he's not English. This is this is so hard for Americans to understand. He's Anglo-Irish. Oh, okay. And the Anglo-Irish, <clears throat> the Anglo-Irish to the Irish, the Anglo-Irish are English. To the English, the Anglo-Irish is just this laughable sport of nature. Um, they don't understand them. So they're stranded, as the great uh, Anglo-Irish novelist Elizabeth Bowen said, that her true place was somewhere halfway between England and Ireland in the Irish Sea. Um, so they, they didn't belong. They had a great sense of place, great sense of self, but they had no actual 
political place in, in Ireland. Yeah, fascinating people. I mean, there are only 5% of the population of Southern Ireland was Protestant. Uh, and in 1922, when the, the Irish state was founded, the Anglo-Irish just said, all right, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And they retreated into their domains, they shut the gates and they retired into their own genteel pursuits. And they left, they left the country to us. Unfortunately, I get into trouble with Irish Americans for this. They left Ireland to the, the small shopkeepers, the small farmers, the priests. And we are still trying to struggle out from under that, that power structure. I wish the Protestants had stayed. I mean, I, you know, partition for Ireland was a disaster. For those of you who don't know, there were 32 counties in Ireland after 1922 in the Civil War, the War of Independence. The six counties of Ireland became Northern Ireland. The 26 counties became the Republic of Ireland. And we lost that great Protestant tradition of, of argument, of, of just not wanting to be part of things that, that, that if we'd had that, this country would be a former healthy and delightful place. Mm -hmm. You really want to get into politics? We could go on all well, night. Well, but, but I do, I do want to, um, you said earlier um, something about the power of the Catholic Church and it looms large in the Cork books, and as you said, in the history of Ireland itself. So introducing this Protestant, young Protestant detective sets that friction, brings it to the, to the Cork books, brings it to the forefront because of the attitudes people have. I understand what you're saying, but the problem is that if there had, should there have been such a being, he would have been marginalized. Mm -hmm. Um, because the Catholic Church was absolutely preeminent. When I went to Eastern Europe in the late 70s and early 80s, I looked around and I said, my God, it's Ireland. Because they had communism to rule their lives from the cradle to the grave. We, the Catholic Church, Catholicism and communism, just two sides of the same coin, absolute power. You might get into trouble, but it's always fascinating to hear somebody who is, this is great. Thank you for your- There's probably, there's probably somebody in the Irish embassy taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's come back to April in Snow, the new book, because um, I mentioned to you April earlier- Snow, that's it. April in Snow, that's a good- that's a I good said problem. it wrong. Yeah. I said it wrong, didn't I? Fine, you, you conflated two books. I Snow did and April. Book. It's April in Spain, of course, and it's set in one of my favorite places in the whole world, San Sebastian, which is in the Basque country of Spain. Why did you choose San Sebastian as the setting of this? Oh, it's very simple. I was on a, I was at a, at a book festival in, I think it was in Bilbao, and I stayed in San Sebastian for a few days at that wonderful hotel, and I fell in love with the place, and I thought, oh, I'll give Quirk a little holiday down here and then ruin his life, which happens at the end of the book. Don't, but, uh, don't, I, just want, don't. I just want to get away from Ireland for a while and write about other places, other climates. Please don't tell the ending of the book because it is shocking. Uh -huh. Don't do that. But I will ask you, since you mentioned giving Quirk a holiday, Quirk isn't much one for holidays. And uh, I'd like to ask you to read a section from the book that describes Quirk's attitude about this whole holiday hotel idea that his lovely wife, Evelyn, has foist upon him. Yeah, well, you know, this, this applies to hotels anywhere. <clears throat> uh, how was it, he wondered, not for the first time, that people seemed oblivious to the brazen confidence trick that was played on them in hotels. It never occurred to them to think 
How many greasy holiday makers, leaky honeymooners, how many oldsters with unpredictable bladders and flaking skin had slept already in the very bed in which they were themselves just now reclining? Did it ever cross their minds that over the years, God knows how many poor souls had breathed their last on the same mattress on which they stretched themselves out so luxuriously at the end of another fun-filled fun day spent prone on the stoneless beach or gambling in the sea as blue as records die. The conspiracy begins the moment you arrive, as he pointed out to Evelyn, who was knitting and wasn't listening. There's a grinning doorman. He yanks open the door of your taxi and gabbles a greeting in pidgin English. There's a beaming girl in black behind the receptionist. Behind the re There's a beaming girl in black behind the reception desk who exclaims in her bounce away that it is a pleasure to welcome you back, even though you've never stayed here before. There is the porter, lean and stooped, with a melancholy eye and a moustache that might have been drawn on with an eyebrow pencil, who festoons himself with your suitcases and staggers away with them to arrive at the door of your room a mysterious 20 minutes later. Was he off in some cubby hole in the meantime, going through your things? And having shown you how, to light, how the light switches work and how to open and close the curtains, loiters expectantly on the threshold with his fake ingratiating smile waiting for his tip. And why? Cork called out whiningly, Evelyn having taken his place in the bathroom. Why must there be so many staff? They were everywhere. Porters, receptionists, waiters, barmen, chambermaids, bellboys, cleaners, and those unaccountable, bossy-looking, middle-aged women in white blouses and black skirts who stride along the corridors, bearing in their chubby hands those mysterious Important looking clipboards. <laughs> <laughs> the bossy oh, woman. Don't feel that about every, 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 every. The bossy woman with their clipboards just. It's, They're always in every hotel, every hotel. They certainly are. And actually, the Times of London called April in Spain your funniest book. And I have to say, I find this hysterical. I, I find Quirk's um, insistence on being unhappy on this vacation, quite funny and delightful. So thank you for that, because it was, the reading illustrates that perfectly. So here is Quirk in this hotel, on this vacation he doesn't want to be on. He's now married happily to Evelyn, an Austrian Jewish psychiatrist. She's the perfect counterpoint to Quirk. And she's so good for him. Tell me about creating the character of Evelyn and why you brought her into Quirk's life. Well, I mean, Quirk, uh, <clears throat> Quirk is a walking um, neurosis. <laughs> it's perfect for him to marry a psychiatrist, a giant psychiatrist at that. <laughs> and she's delightful. And she's, she brings joy into his life. She offers him the possibility of knowing himself, which of course is the last thing he wants to know. Um, and I love her. She's a wonderful creature. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Alas, but... <laughs> he's, look, Evelyn is every woman I've ever known. Really? Every, so? But then every woman. My book is every woman I've ever known. How so? How is Evelyn every woman you've ever known? Oh, she understands Quirk in a way that Quirk would never understand himself. He certainly can't understand her. I mean, women to me are, God, again, the feminists would be out to get me or whatever they're called nowadays. Women to me are an absolute, unending, delightful mystery. Uh, I would hate to get to a point where I felt that I understood women. I love the fact that I don't understand them. Mm -hmm. They understand me, unfortunately. They understand me <laughs> well. I don't understand them. Um, so she's, yeah, she's, she's, a, she's a wonderful woman. Uh, but of course, poor old Quirk, you know, she drags him on this holiday. I must tell you that years ago, the, the playwright Brian Friel, he was in France on holiday and he... <laughs> He sent me a postcard and it said, here for two weeks, one with good behavior. 
Um, and that's exactly, see, this is my feeling about holidays. I don't know what to do on holiday. I, I always think only people who are unhappy in their lives need holidays. And I'm perfectly happy in my, my life. I mean, for me, I would like a seven day week. I, I hate weekends. I wake on Saturday mornings and my God, what am I going to do with the day? And on holidays especially, I get into a panic. And I make my, my poor family's life in misery when I'm on holiday saying, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? And then they make me have a drink at about 7.30 in the morning. Well, not 7.30. Say 11.30. They say, here, have a drink. Have a drink. And then I begin to calm down. Do you write uh, on the holiday? I don't, I don't know. You see, in my, in my, I don't know if anybody reads Who's Who anymore, but in my Who's Who entry under hobbies or whatever it is, mine is work. Work is what I do for relaxation. I don't know why anybody would want not to work. Um, I, I just wouldn't know what to do. And Quirk is like that. He can't understand why people want free time. Free time to me is, is a torment. And you know, I've always felt that one of the great forces in human affairs is the fear of boredom. One of the great unacknowledged forces. People will do anything in order not to be bored. They will create mayhem. They will start world wars in order not to be bored. They will elect unsuitable presidents, so as not to be bored. Um, and we're all the same. We do anything not to be bored. Uh, and it's something we should be aware of. So that we should acknowledge more is our propensity to, all life tends toward boredom. The moment you start moving, you start to be bored. This is why we keep moving all the time. This is why I'm so lucky. I mean, I'm, a writer, you're a writer, we, we always have something to do. Our minds are always occupied, 24 hours a day. I go to bed at night and if I, on good nights when I fall asleep, the fiction starts up, these mad dreams. Uh, I go to other worlds, other countries, I become other people, I become young again, I, I'm dead, I come back to life. Everything is possible in dreams. This is this great, it's impossible to be bored in dreamland. Never thought about that. If, if things get, if things get, begin to be even the slightest bit dull, the dream manager will send you to somewhere else. If only that could happen in life. <laughs> if only, if only. Um, so you said so many things that I want to follow up on, um, but I had one question about the setting of this book that um, I didn't get to ask you yet, which is that it's set in the Basque country during the reign of Franco, which of course is um, Quirk's time. And you alluded to this before. Um, what, what about that time interested you? And was it the analogy, the analogous situation with Ireland? Well, yes, I mean, I went to Spain in the early 60s. <clears throat> and again, I felt at home to a certain extent, except that there was sunshine, there was wine, there was good food. There were these beautiful, beautiful people, all suntanned. Uh, they weren't even suntanned, this was their skin color. We were these pale, shrinking creatures. Uh, we didn't know how to live. Uh, despite Franco, and look, you know, Spain in the early 60s was a tough place. It was a tough, tough place. Uh, it was policed. Everywhere you went, there were police watching what you did, what you said. Uh, of course, I felt quite at home. Uh, of course, it was a, a time in which I grew up in the 1950s, into, well into the 60s now, and it was a mean time a very mean time, um, but it's a bit like, you know, I used to go in those days to see those Antonioni movies, those new wave movies from France and 
Italy, but I loved particularly Antonioni because I would go to see La Ventura or La Notte. Or, and those, and I, I was just think, I was 15 sitting there in the cinema looking at the screen saying, oh, to be existentially unhappy with Monica Vitti. <laughs> It's going to be Monica Beatty and I can be unhappy forever. So, you know, it was, I mean, when I was on the Arts Council in Ireland in the early 80s, the only thing that I fought for really hard was to get bursaries, get money for artists to leave Ireland and go take two or three months abroad to get off the island. Because, you know, Ireland... In those days, and even still, thought it was the centre of the world. We're the navel of the universe, um, which of course we're not. So to escape from here and to see a wider world, I remember the first, I went to England, but the first European country that I went to, I don't regard England as European, the first European country I went to, a uh, city I went to was Paris. And I remember walking through the Luxembourg Gardens I see these enormous statues. These enormous, enormous, wonderful statues. Because in Ireland, you know, we build these enormous, we built these, we built these enormous plinths, tiny statues standing on. <laughs> and so we're afraid of the plinth. The plinth is, and here were these great heroic figures. And I've never forgotten it. And here was a, a vision of French, you know, the notion of gloire, of largeness largeness of life. Um, this is revolutionary for me because in Ireland what we were told is this life is nothing. This is just a little grey area we're going through before we go move on to the great world beyond. All these mad religions are the same. Islam is the same. I, mean, I thought there would never be a worse religion than Catholicism then I discovered Islam. Now they're coming for me. I can hear them coming for me. Are determined to be controversial. You're courting disaster. I'm not controversial. I'm not going to be controversial. I'm simply saying well, everybody knows it's true. Um, you know, religion is a limitation on life. Religion is uh, telling us that that the, our physical selves uh, are despicable. And that the world that we live in is our world to display to display. Despoil. Despoil, as we like, and we've done. We've done that. We're destroying this, this beautiful, beautiful, exquisite planet that we were given. And that's, that's down to religion. Now, maybe we would find another reason to do it, but certainly religion has encouraged us. When I was a little boy going to school, you know, the catechism, who made the world? God made the world. Why did God make the world? God made the world for man's use and benefit. There is no God, and if there were, he shouldn't have made the world for our use and benefit. The animals are just as important as we are, and we constantly forget that we are animals as well. Yeah. We should bethink ourselves. We're merely animals that got self-consciousness to our great cost. You know, if we, I mean, of course, self-consciousness gives us a great sense of life, great sense of the richness of life. Um, I wrote a little play, it doesn't matter what it was about, but the philosopher says, I, death stands at the elbow of the midwife and says, give me the child. I will give the child life, because it's death that gives us life. But religion denies that. Religion says there is no death. There's a great, great injustices that was done to us. Everyone as the great poet Rilke said, every man deserves his own death. You said something about um, the importance of getting artists off the island and exposing them to the great cultural capitals of the world. Yet there is a magnificent literary tradition in Ireland, so much great writing comes out of Ireland. Is that because of the difficulty? Where does all uh, of that brilliant writing come from? 
Well, first of all, I didn't want to get artists off the island to take part in this great culture. I wanted to get artists off the island to sit at a, a little cafe in Paris and have a glass of wine and a cup of good coffee. I wanted to have an affair. I wanted to go to Rome and, you know, walk the streets. That's what I wanted them to do. Uh, culture is as much a street cafe and a glass of wine as it is imbibing the, the great art of Europe and America. Um, the second part is that as to why we produce many writers, I think it's that <laughs> mm. we are very careful here. We lost our language in the middle of the 19th century. We gave up the Irish language in the space of 10 years. It was the 10 years, the Great Famine, when a million people died, a million people emigrated. The greatest catastrophe this country has ever suffered. And out of some kind of shame, national shame, we gave up the language. And we took on basic English. Basic English is like the Latin of the Roman Empire. It's a language of command, of direct statement, of sort of no nonsense, no nonsense language. And we took that and we transformed it. We transformed it into our version of English, which we call Hiberno English. Uh, the Irish language is a very beautiful language. It's very equivocal. You can't say no in Irish. You're going to say it is not so, but you can't say no. There's no word for no. In Irish, you can't say I am a man. No way of saying that. You can say I'm in my manner. So it's all, all sideways. It's all it's, it's, it's kind of poetic, poetic language. And even though we lost it back in the 19th century, we've kept the deep grammar of it. Our minds still work in that roundabout poetic way. But we apply that to, to English. And that's what, if you look at, even before, the, if you look at Swift, look at Goldsmith, look at Oscar Wilde, George Bernard Shaw, Yeats, Joyce, Beckett. Look what we did with the language they gave us. We took it from the conqueror and we made it a thing that they now envy. So this was our, this was our freeing of ourselves to take the language. We spotted what was most important was the language. Not the money, not the land, not the power, but the language. And you know, I'm, you know, I regard myself as a patriot. I'm certainly not a nationalist. I would feel at home in Kazakhstan as I do here. But I'm certainly a patriot in that sense that, that we have the language, we, we speak this. And we do speak it to a certain extent. I mean, we write it, but we, we certainly speak it as well. We, we, love, we love the ambiguity of language. We love the fact that a word can mean two or three things at the same time. We just love that. Mm -hmm. um, go on. Uh, well, um, uh, yeah, that gives me a lot to think about. Um, getting back to the book for a moment, April in Spain, without spoiling. After. And the book has a shocking ending. It was shocking to me. I was not prepared for it. I doubt anyone who reads this book will be prepared for it. It's, it's devastating and very effective. Tell me about how much you deliberated about this ending or did you know when you started the book that this was how it was going to end? No, no, I never know. I just make it up as I go along. This is a great joy of writing these books. One of the, the, the crime books that I wrote, I was three pages from the end. I still didn't know who had done the, the killing and I didn't care. You know, Raymond Chandler famously said, I really don't care who killed Professor Plum with the lead pipe in the library. I don't care about plot. Plot is a no. You know, people say to me, oh, 
about my other books, my, my non-crime books. Oh, you know, plot. I said, well, I don't think that life has a plot, do you? Life hasn't got a plot. Life is just drift. We drift and we drift and we think that we know what we're doing. All decisions are made in retrospect. We think that, oh, I decided to do that. We didn't. We just hit on something. And then all decisions are wrong anyway. If you have two alternatives, both alternatives are wrong. Uh, you know, you take one, that's wrong. That would have been wrong anyway. Um, that's the glory of life, that it is entirely ambiguous and directionless. And we drift, we drift, and there's, that's the glory of life, we drift. So I don't know, you know, writing these books, I, as I say, I make it up as I go along. And I like to think that that's, oh, one of their main qualities is quality of spontaneity. You know, when I was a little boy, I used to read Agatha Christie and so on. Of course, I enjoy them immensely, and Agatha Christie is a great genius in her way, but it was like doing a crossword puzzle or a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you know when you do a crossword puzzle, you come to the end of it, you think, oh, why did I spend that time doing that? It was empty time. I want people to feel alive when they're reading these books. I want, people, I want readers to feel that, oh gosh, what's going to happen next? What's going to go? Not caring about, not worrying about who did the crime. It doesn't matter who did the crime, who did the killing. Uh, who done it? is of no importance to me. Why done it maybe is of some consequence, but who done it? Or what's done, and I'm not gonna spoil it as I keep saying, but at the end of this book, it's a little bit of the who done it, but it's the more what's done, but I'm gonna stop there because- Oh, thank you. Yes, but just before you stop, if you go back through the book, if you read it again, it's absolutely inevitable. The end is inevitable from the very beginning. Uh, I didn't know that. When I finished the book, I thought, yeah, this is how it has to be. And a couple of my editors, two or three of my editors, a couple of my translators begged me to change the ending, not to do this. They were all female, by the way. Anyway, yes. go on, go on. <laughs> um, we have a, a question from one of our viewers about um, the Quirk TV series. Um, Quirk might be a pretty miserable character, but He's very appealing, so much so that uh, he had quite a large TV audience. I believe it was, um, was it Gabrielle Byrne? Gabrielle Byrne, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so what was your reaction to that and how involved were you with the television series? Oh, I wasn't involved at all. I didn't write it and I didn't, uh, I, I had dinner with them before they started and that was about it. Um, I liked it. I, I thought it was immensely atmospheric. A friend of mine who's my age, he said, uh, I watched that series. It was so like being back in those times. He said, I wouldn't want to be back in those times. So it was dark and atmospheric. Uh, yeah, it was. I'd like to do another one. I'd like to write it this time myself. So. With Sinjin? Yeah, maybe so. Any directors out there? Um, <laughs> I'm sure there would be takers for that. Um, so your last not quirk book, I believe, was Mrs. Osmond. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Which was a sequel to Henry James's Portrait of a Lady. And you channel James's style. It's almost it's it's uncanny. Um, tell us a little bit about the experience of the book and why you wanted to write a sequel. Well, um, <clears throat> my wife had been urging me for years to write a sequel to the Portrait of Lady, and I said, no, I couldn't. I would feel like a, a jackal feeding on the carcass of a, a great beast. Uh, and then one day I thought, no, I'll, I'll do it. It was a kind of jeu d'esprit. It was an adventure. Mm -hmm. and, um, there is a, I'd already done a, a Raymond Chandler book, a, a Philip Marlowe book. Mm -hmm. And it was the same experience where uh, neuroscientists tell me, and I know a few of them, they tell me that it's possible when we're faced with a task that's, <clears throat> that's quite like what we usually do, but isn't quite, that we can induce in ourselves a state of self-hypnosis in order to get the work done. 
And I've, the Chandler book, the Marlow book, I have no memory of whatsoever. I wrote it over a summer. I remember, I mean, I know I was there, but I have no memory of doing it, not at all. And when I was doing the, the Henry James sequel, I was in Chicago, I was teaching, <laughs> quote unquote, teaching at the University of Chicago. And I was living on campus and since the University of Chicago campus absolutely without anything, there wasn't even a bar there. Uh, so I had lots of time to write. And uh, I, I, would spend, I would spend whole days writing happily. And sometimes I would watch, I would look to the side and watch my hand writing because I write with a phantom pen, you know. I would oh, watch yeah. My hand. oh yeah, I would watch my hand writing from the side. No, I'm not mystical. I'm not saying that I was infused with the spirit of Henry James, but um, I wasn't quite there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I was amazed that I could produce this, this stuff. I don't know if I would do it again. I've often thought of trying to write a George Simenon novel, but I couldn't because the essence of Simenon is that there's no style. Chandler has a style, Henry James has a style, but Simon has no style. That's, that's part of his greatness. Didn't so, he admire yeah. the Quirk books, Inspector Marguerite? Oh, yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Simino is, 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 was the father of, of Benjamin Black. I, I came late to Simino books. I didn't begin to read them until about 2002 when the English philosopher John Gray put me on to him and said, you really should read these. I was astonished. Wonderful, the one. Simon was one of the great, one of the great literary figures of the 20th century. Uh, every year when the Nobel Prize came out, he just kept furious because they wouldn't give it to him. But they wouldn't give it to him because they thought he was a pop novelist, but he wasn't. Uh, he was, he was uh, any of your readers who haven't discovered Simon, I really would recommend, especially the books that he called his Roman Dure, his, his, his hard novels. Lots of which are about 12 or so are published in New York Review books, editions, very handsome paperbacks. And I would, I would really recommend go to them, things like Dirty Snow or Lucy Mond Vanishes. These are, these are great, great, great books. And I, I'll tell you a nice little anecdote. I was staying at my agent's house in, in Long Island, one of those ports, I don't know. I can't remember the name of the town. And I was doing a reading at a little bookshop nearby, just as favoured him. And uh, after the reading, there was a Q&A and they asked me about Simenon. I said, you know, Simenon is one of the great writers. And the man came to me at the end of it and he said, um, he said, you, you, you were very amusing. He said, my father, my father wasn't funny. And I said, who's your father? He said, George Simenon. He was Simenon's son. Pure coincidence. It was wonderful. And we've become friends since then. Wonderful man, John Simenon. Um, so that was a wonderfully serendipitous moment. Maybe George, sent, maybe George sent us together, you know. Perhaps. Speaking of that novel, um, a uh, sequel to Henry James' Portrait of a Lady and channeling Henry James, although it's not a sequel at all, your uh, fellow countryman, um, Colm Toybean, has just written The Magician uh, that is about the life and very much the inner life of Thomas Mann. Have you read it? And, yes, yes. and? Wonderful book, wonderful achievement. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't do it, I couldn't do that. Um, I wouldn't be able to uh, inhabit a life in the way that Colm has. Yeah. It's masterly. Well, John Banville, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. Um, and thank you for giving us an insight into your process, but mostly thank you for your work. Um, the, uh, the quirk novels are wonderful. The non-quirk novels written under John Banville, extraordinary, of course. And again, I'm just gonna have to do a big shout out for Time Pieces, a Dublin memoir, because I love that book so very much. 
I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It was an absolute pleasure. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you, my dear. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. <laughs> Good night. Bye -bye.